Last month, there was an annular eclipse of the sun when the moon passed in front of the sun and partially blocked it out. Unfortunately, it couldn't be seen from here. It was seen from places such as the East Indies. I couldn't go. Christopher Doherty did and took these pictures. And there we see the dark body of the moon and a ring of sunlight left around. The reason for that is that that happened when the moon was almost as far from the Earth as it can be, and therefore didn't appear quite large enough to block the sun out completely, and a ring was left showing, Latin annulus ring, and you couldn't see the corona and the prominences. All the same, an interesting sight. But of course, we are all getting geared up now for 11th of August next year, when there'll be a total eclipse of the sun visible from the West Country. And that is really a glorious sight with the corona and the prominences, and by all means, go and see it. But remember, Cornwall and Devon are going to be jam-packed, and I think Cornwall may sink under the weight of people going there. And talking about the sun, there's interesting news about the solar and heliospheric satellite, SOHO, which went out of contact. It's now been found, and again, pointing at the sun, so there's pretty good chance, I think, of bringing it back into operation, which will be a very good thing. We also heard more about discovery of ice on the moon inside polar craters. I remain highly skeptical, but time will tell. Certainly, new studies have been made of the larger moon of Mars, Phobos, a curious little body, less than 20 miles across, and apparently uh, covered with soft dust, knee-deep in soft dust. Mind you, Phobos is quite unlike our own massive moon, and I'm quite sure that during the next century, it's going to be pressed into service as a very convenient natural space station. And now, onto our main theme, the evening sky in autumn. It's sometimes said that the evening sky in autumn is less interesting than at other times of the year. Well, I don't know about that. Certainly, we are still seeing the summer triangle, even though it's getting rather low, made up of three brilliant stars, Vega in Lyra, Denim in Cygnus, and Altair in Aquila. But why the summer triangle? Well, I'm afraid I'm responsible for that name. I used it in a Sky at Night program, literally 40 years ago, and it caught on, and everyone uses it now, even though it is completely unofficial, and the three stars are not even in the same constellation. Actually, Altair does set from here, Vega and Deneb do not. Also, we have not yet got, in the evening sky, the magnificent Orion. Orion the hunter, who will dominate the entire scene all through winter and early spring, the belt, the gleaming sword, the orange-red Betelgeuse, and the glittering white Rigel. You can see it now, but it does rise rather late. You can't see it yet in the evenings. So, what is the main evening constellation now? It is Pegasus. The four main stars of Pegasus make up a square, and you see them now due south immediately after dark, and they're very easy to find, even though some people expect them to be smaller and brighter than the square really is. In mythology, Pegasus was a flying horse. And there the picture of the horse in a rather undignified upside-down position. And in the old story, carried the hero, Bellerophon, in quest of a particularly nasty, fire-breathing monster called the Chimera. I may say, Bellerophon later came to a rather untimely end, but that wasn't the fault of Pegasus. And certainly, Pegasus itself is a, an easy constellation to find. Now, the four stars in the square had been given Greek letters. This was an idea worked out in 1603 by the German astronomer Johann Bayer, who drew up a new star catalogue and introduced a system which is, works very well. He gave the stars in each constellation Greek letters, beginning with the brightest star, the first letter, Alpha, then Beta, Gamma, Delta, and so on, right down to Omega. And that system is very satisfactory, and we still use it. So all the stars in the square have got their Greek letters. But one strange thing, you see there, there are two alphas, one in the bottom right, other to the upper left. And there's a rather strange reason for that. Originally, the four stars in Pegasus were given their letters, and the top left star was Delta, Delta Pegasi. Then, for some extraordinary reason, and I've never found why, the controlling body of world astronomy, the International Astronomical Union, revised the boundaries and transferred Delta Pegasi to the adjacent constellation, Andromeda, and made it Alpha Andromedae. So that star on the square is now in Andromeda. And I don't really understand why, because Andromeda is rather an amorphous constellation. In mythology, 
Andromeda was a beautiful princess in the sky, merely a line of stars. And it does seem illogical because that star so obviously belongs to the square of Pegasus and has no connection with Andromeda. But nevertheless, the decision was made and uh, we have to live with it. So Delta Pegasi is now Alpha Andromedae. The stars also have individual or proper names. In fact, many stars have, but generally, astronomers use names only for the very brightest stars. But those in the square have got their names. And there they are, Alpharats, Scat, Algonib, and Markab. Although astronomers usually call them Alpha Andromedae and Alpha, Beta, and Gamma Pegasi. The stars in the square are not all equally bright. A star's apparent brilliancy is defined by what we call magnitude. And the scale works in the manner of a golfer's handicap, with the brighter performers having the lower figures. So stars of magnitude 1 are brighter than 2, 2 brighter than 3, and so on. And the faintest stars you can normally see with the naked eye are about magnitude 6. And the stars on the square are all between 2 and 3. When you go 2.1 for Alphawitz, down to 2.8 for Algonip, and so on the square, the brightest of those stars is Alpharats, in fact, it's the brightest of Algonib. But that doesn't mean that Alpharats is the most powerful star. It's not, in fact. Remember, the stars are at very different distances from us. And the stars on the square are not really related at all. It's merely a line of sight effect. And their distances vary. You can't conveniently give star distances in miles or kilometers. It's far too short. I mean, rather like given this between London and Manchester in inches. Therefore, we use a different unit, the light year. Light flashes along at 186,000 miles every second. So in one year, light covers nearly 6 million million miles, and that's what we call a light year. The nearest star beyond the sun is over 4 light years away, and the stars in Pegasus are much further away from that. And here are their distances. As you can see, far Algonib is far the most distant, also the most luminous. And they're not really related at all. And if we were looking at them from some other vantage point, we wouldn't see a square. Algonib there is right in the background. Also, it's much more luminous, much more powerful than our sun. In fact, our Algonib is more than 1,000 times as powerful as our sun, and Markab only 60 times. So a star's apparent brilliancy is no definite clue to its real luminosity. A star may look bright either because it's really very luminous or because it's close, close to us or a combination of both. The apparent magnitude is no reliable key. And then also, what about colours? Look closely at this photograph of the square and look at Scat, the upper star to the right. And you may be able to see it is slightly orange in colour, though the other three are white. And that really is so. And if you take binoculars, it brings out very clearly. Look first at Alpharats and then at Scat, and you'll see the difference straight away. Scat really is a lovely orange colour. And the reason is quite clear cut, it's not so hot as the others. Orange heat is not so hot as white heat, because our yellow sun comes in between the two. So Scat is a, has a cooler surface, even though it is, in fact, a very large star indeed. And they thought there are letters there, A, B, and M. And these are what we call spectral types. The stars are graded into various classes, given letters of the alphabet, and A and B stars are hot and white, and M stars are cooler and orange red, so Scat is a star of type N. And like many of these stars, Scat is quite definitely variable. You can watch it changing from one night to another. The magnitude ranges from 2.3 to 2.8 in a rough period of about 38 days, and you can quite easily draw up a light curve, as I've done there. As you can see, sometimes magnitude 2.3, that's brighter than Markab. Sometimes down to 2.8, no brighter than Algorithm. And there's a rough period of just over 38 days, but in this case it is rough. I must say, the reason for that is that Scat is an old, unstable star, used up much of its fuel, so to speak, now swelling and shrinking, and changing its output as it does so. And many of these red stars do the same thing. Uh, Betelgeuse and Orion does, that also is um, a variable star. And the thing to do is to compare Scat with um, Markab, preferably, and see how bright it is. And if you're watching from night to night, you can see there are quite definite changes there. Variable stars are very, very common in the sky. Lucky for us, our sun is not one.
Something else, too. How many stars inside the square can you see on a dark, clear night with the naked eye? Well, I wonder. With my monocle firmly in position, I reckon I can get to about a dozen. People with better sight may see more. I'd be interested to know. There's one other bright star in Pegasus, not in the square, and that is Enif, or Epsilon Pegasi, over to the west. Magnitude 2.3, therefore, again, the same magnitude order. It's an orange star, rather undistinguished, and uh, been suspected of being variable, but uh, I think possibly that may not be so. Anyway, there it is, the other main star outside the main square of Pegasus, but part of the flying horse. And not far from there, there's a very interesting thing indeed, a globular cluster. Let's go back to our diagram, begin with the rather inconspicuous theta, go a line through epsilon, or nf, and then come to a, a very faint, misty blob. I don't think you'll see it with the naked eye, I certainly can't, but they're not going to show it. It's called M15. Why M? Well, way back in 1781, the French astronomer, Charles Messier, decided to draw up a catalogue of star clusters and nebulae, which he duly did, and we still use that catalogue. And so this one was number 15 in Messier's catalogue, M15 Pegasi. And uh, it appears as a patch, and look at the telescope, and you'll see it is a lovely globular cluster made up of stars, probably about a million stars in that, and telescopes resolve it quite easily. Although in the middle, the stars are very closely packed, even though they're in no real danger of collision. A lovely sight. It's only one of many. Globular clusters lie around the edges of our main star system or galaxy. Our galaxy contains roughly 100,000 million stars, and it's a flattened system, shaped rather like, let's say, two fried eggs clapped together back to back. And globular clusters lie around the edge, and those blobs above and below and around, those are the globular clusters. And they are spectacular things, about a hundred are known. And uh, just imagine what we'd see if we lived on a planet either inside or close to a globular cluster. Here's Brian Smallwood's idea of a planet going around a star, very near a globular cluster. The night sky would indeed be magnificent with many stars only light days away, casting shadows, and there'd be no proper darkness at all. And I must say, that globular cluster is 49,000 light years away from us. So we're seeing as it was, not now, as it was 49,000 years ago. And if there are beings on planets there, and they're seeing us, they see Earth and the Sun as it was 49,000 years ago. Once we look beyond our own solar system, our view of the universe is going to be very out of date. And even 49,000 light years is not really very far on the cosmic scale. Let's turn to something else, the great spiral in Andromeda. Remember Delta Pegasi, now Alpha Andromedae? Well, Andromeda extends in a line of stars from there, and you'll see there a faint blob, M31, the 31st object in Charles Messier's catalogue. You can just see it with the naked eye, but not going to show it. But to see it properly, you need photographs taken with a large telescope, as here. And it is, in fact, a spiral. Well, they're rather, unfortunately, edgewise onto us, and the spiral effect is largely lost. But it is a spiral. And that is an independent galaxy, far larger than ours, containing more than our quota of 100,000 million stars, and over 2 million light years away. We are seeing that as it was more than two million years ago. And even so, it's one of the very closest of the outer galaxies. There are many of these, and Andromeda is a particularly fine specimen, the largest in our own particular local group. So by all means, go and find it. We're not going to show it. Telescope is a blob, and then we'll just check up. And remember, you're looking backwards in time, as well as right out into the vastness of space. Still in Andromeda, the end star of the line is Gamma Andromedae, or Almark. Looks like an ordinary star, and binoculars show it's an ordinary star. But with a telescope, it's a lovely coloured double, and well worth looking at. And those stars are genuinely associated, and make up what we call a binary system. There are many of those in the sky. You know, one of the best ways to find your way around the sky is to take certain very obvious constellations, and then use those as guides. That's what I did when I was a boy. I remember deciding to learn one new 
constellation every night. It doesn't take long. And Pegasus can be very useful there. For example, take a line from Scat, pass it to Mark Ave, and go on almost to the horizon. And there you will find a bright star, which is Fomalhaut in the constellation of the Southern Fish. The southernmost of the first magnitude stars visible from here, from North Scotland, you hardly see it at all. A near neighbor, 22 light years away, and 13 sun power, and surrounded by a cloud of rarefied cool material that may be planet forming. We don't know. Don't mix it up with Difter in Cetus the Whale, which is over to the east, not so bright, and rather high up, a rather undistinguished orange kind of star. So they're easy to find. And also in that area now are the two giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, looking like stars because very different, world shining by reflected sunlight. Jupiter, so bright you can't possibly overlook it, and Saturn, further to the east, rather higher up, looking like a bright star, brighter than any of the stars in the square. And telescopes show a great deal upon those two giant worlds. All astronomers keep observation books, and I've got two of mine here. Here's my Saturn book. A few years ago, the ring of Edgewise on. These rings, of course, are glorious things. They're made of icy particles, a yellowish flattened globe over 70,000 miles across. The rings now are better placed, and there's a drawing I made the night or two ago, and a telescope will show Saturn like that. And to me, Saturn is the loveliest object in the entire sky. And then Jupiter, the giant world, a yellowish flattened globe crossed by the dark belts that you can see there, and with the four bright moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So, quite apart from the giant planets, there's plenty to see in the autumn sky. You've got the globular cluster, the great spiral, colored stars, double stars, variable stars, and above all, if it's clear tonight, then I do suggest you go out and make the acquaintance of the flying horse of autumn. When I come back next month, I'll be joined by Dr. John Mason. We were talking about the Leonid meteor storm. We may, I say may, have a brilliant shower of shooting stars on November the 17th. I can't guarantee it, but it's possible and certainly worth looking out for. So John Mason will join me and we'll tell you what we, what we may or may not see. Also, it's newsletter time. You want the newsletter? Then send in your stamp to the envelope to New Letter 71, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, w 12 s On the latest news, dial up our information line, 0891-800-330, or if you like, CFAX, page 620. So, let's hope for clear skies on November 17th. We may be in for a real treat, and next month, John Mason and I will tell you what we may or may not expect. So until then, good night.